The views on this program do not reflect those of ONTV or its board of directors. Welcome to OAA Now, your home for Oakland Activities Association news and information. Here's your host, Sammy Taramina. Welcome to OAA Now. Here I'm Sammy Taramina, blog around the OAA, the host of Last Three Brain Cells, and the host of Between Taramina's on Orient News Ocean. Like welcome those watching on a local voice on SoundCloud and those watching on YouTube. We do got another state championship team called this week, of course, some Troy Athens boys soccer. Um, going into Grand Ledge and knocking off Brighton 2-1 to one in overtime. Um, Athens scoring a goal late um, to tie it up and then force the overtime. Then they got a, an early goal in overtime to um, to win it. And then they had to held on um, for the 2-1 to one win for them. So... Big props to the Red Hawks for um, winning the um, Division One State Championship in boys soccer. Um, the way the path that they've been through, um, just got to give them the credit where credit's due. I mean, give credit where credit's due with Troy Athens. Um, you know, they had a great year. Um, you know, I mean, one of those teams that were near the top of the red this year and then having that playoff run going through that very tough district, um, knocking off Berkeley, then knocking off Troy, then being Rochester Adams. Um, you know, then going by Utica Ford and then um, getting by Northville on their home field in the state semifinals and then getting by Brighton. And heck of a year for Troy Athens soccer. Um, and it's a good, I mean, like in the OA, you know what I mean? Keeping the um, the um, Division One state championship in soccer in the league. So congrats to that. Um, so, um, you know, so... And then also volleyball still going on. We got two teams left around there. Um, you got Bright. You got Bloomfield Hills, of course, winning that district over at Waterford Mott. Um, they take on Utica Eisenhower um, over at Macomb, Dakota. If they win that, then most likely we'll be seeing Macomb Lance Cruz North. Um, and then you have Clarkston, of course, who won the um, the um, district champ title at Lake Orion. I'm knocking off Lake Orion and also Walled Lake Northern in four games. So now Clarkson will take on... Um, and now Clarkson will take on Heartland, um, and then that winner will take on either Flushing or um, or Romeo. And, you know, both those teams won home districts. Uh, Flushing, of course, knocking off Grand Blank. Romeo, I think they knocked off Port Huron. Um, so now, you know, those two teams are going to face. So when I look at that regional over at, over at Grand Blank, so I'm going to take um, – I'm going to take Clarkston in that region. And I got Boone Bay Hills winning their region over at Macomb, Dakota. So we'll see what happens. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, the, the two the two regions will meet each other in the state quarterfinals. Um, so I kind of look at with volleyball, you know what I mean, more of like a similar path. I think Clarkston's got a really good path if things work out to get to the final four. But they're going to have to likely deal with Birmingham Marion. So... We'll see what happens there in that one. So we're going to recap off. We're going to go into fo football here shortly here. Obviously, a lot to talk about. Um, just some terrible officiated games over at um, Lake Orion and um, West and um, at, um, and at Swinehart. We're going to talk those games. Um, so we're going to talk those as well. So, you know, bring up recapping those games as well. Um, also, Southfield's win against Detroit Cast Tech. Um you know, I th why I thought, you know, Isaiah Marshall and Juwan Jarrett had a heck of a game. Um, that was a um, very good game for both both them players. Now they move on to take on Chippewa Valley over at, um, over in Chippewa Valley. So that'll be a really interesting matchup between the Big Reds and the Warriors. Um, Harper Woods, no issue with um, Marysville. Um, getting ready. They're moving on for Saturday game at Carlton Airport. So we'll talk about that one. Seahome, of course, um, moving on. Um, now, Seahome following the water for Mott. I mean, after we talked about with Caleb Osborne. Um, so, we're going to break down all those games. Also, um, you know, we're going to talk about some of my grievances, especially with the officiating over at Lake Orion and Swinehart. Um, so, without further ado, let's let's look at the games. Let's go to D4 first. Um, obviously, um, Harper Woods knocking off Marysville 50 to nothing. Um, Good performances from Simon Buford. Nate Washell had a nice game. Um, Kobe Taylor played well. Um, Harper with his defense, they were outstanding. Um, so for Coach Rob Odin, um, playing the OA, playing those D1-D2s paid off. And now they get a very tall task 
ahead of them on Saturday afternoon when they go play Carlton Airport. Um, Airport knocked off Dearborn Divine Child. Um, so that'll be a really interesting matchup over there at Harper with them. A little surprised the Saturday afternoon game considering, you know, it's a little bit closer between Wayne County and Monroe County. Um, so I guess Harper Woods decided, you know, we can play it on Saturday or another reason why is they could be, you know, past the um, 90 mile radius. Of course, you know, I know Carlton, um, is in Monroe County, um, and Harper Woods, we know is in, um, Northern Northeastern Wayne County. So, so I think that's probably the reason why they're playing on Saturday afternoon. So, but credit where credit's due. I mean, obviously, um, for Harper Woods, they get to move on to the next round. Um, I think their path might be a little bit easier now, obviously, with obviously the Hazlitt upset in Chelsea. That was a that was a big shock. Um, even though Hazlitt's a tough team. Um, but I think, you know what I mean, obviously when you look at that situation, D four, um, obviously with Harper Woods, I really think their path to um to Ford Field is, is maybe a little bit more smooth. Um, but we'll see. I mean, obviously you still got some pretty good teams, especially in mid Michigan. That they're going to have to deal with for sure. So, if you're Coach Rob Odin, you know, you're rolling, you're clicking on all cylinders, you're getting ready for the next round. Um, I think being in D4 is going to help them. Playing that type of schedule kind of helps them. And, you know, and I think it, and for Harper Woods, it's going to really help them get to that next level. And Harper Woods has got a pretty nice pass. So, we'll see what happens. If they don't have to deal with the perennial powers of the west side of the state. Um, where they could meet in the state final. So Harper Woods has got a pretty nice pass, um, you know, to um to get there. So a lot to really look at with them. Um, a lot to be excited about if you're a Pioneer fan. And Coach Rob Odin, um, you know Dakota Gary, I know got hurt a couple weeks ago. I'm not sure if he's back or not. Um, Jacob Odin, I know he's he's been playing really well for Harper Woods, and you know, and I think obviously um. You know, get credit where credit's due. And, you know, I really think Harper Woods, the way that that team's been playing, um, you got to like where they're at right now. You really got to like where they are at. And I think right now they are rolling all cylinders right now in D4. So we'll see what happens going forward, Harper Woods. But winning a very tough, um, very hard-fought game against Croswell Lex in the first round, um, it was a hard-fought game. Don't get me wrong. That game with Croswell Lex was really, really tough. And for Harper was to win that game, that says a lot, a lot of credit to do there. And I think the Pioneers right now, I really like where they're at right now. And I think it's a good thing to know at, with them, Harper Woods. So, you know, I really, th I like where they're at right now. Um, you know, you got to give um, them credit. I mean, they move on, take on a very good Carlton Airport team. We know Carlton Airport's been scoring points and bunches, but I'll be honest with you, I don't think they've seen a team like Harper Woods, so, you know, and Harper Woods, we know, has got all those proven athletes. Um, they can go the quarterback system, you know, when most teams can. I mean, Stephon Buford, obviously, you know, you can put him anywhere. Nate Washell is a pure quarterback. I remember talking to Coach Rob Odin um, before the preview show, and we had a nice, we had a great conversation about Harper Woods and their program, and I really liked where this pre this program has been going. Um, if you can get, I mean, like when I look at Harper Woods' road in the postseason, to me, this is where I think that it's clear. I really like the direction that program has been going. Um, they're also young, but also they have veterans. Their defense has been very good lately. And, you know, you got to look at it the last two weeks, you know, only allowing six points. You know what I mean? That says a lot. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, like only allowing like 13 points. That's a pretty good number for Coach um, Rob Odin. So a lot to love when you look at Harper Woods um, in that one. Um, Wall Lake Western 50-22 over Avondale. Um, you kind of knew it was going to be a tough matchup for Coach Bob Meyer. For Coach Bob Meyer and um, in Avondale, you knew it was going to be really tough, really difficult. Um, you know, Wall Lake Western they went on that early early lead and. And um, Avondale fought back, but just didn't have enough in the tank. And, you know, and, and it's and it's really unfortunate, especially for um, Avondale this year. I mean, like, they had a great year. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, they had a 
incredible season um, where they won the gold. They learned, they know how to win different ways. Um, they ran, they, they changed offenses this year, going from more of a spread, a spread attack to more of that wing T approach where on um, that misdirection that Bob Meyer loves when he was at Wall Lake um, Central and also at Livoni Clarenceville. Um, Jake, I mean, like Tommy, Her I mean, Jake Herzog, I'll tell you what, I mean, like, I, I mean, like that kid is an absolute warrior. I mean, he had an incredible incredible year at quarterback. I mean, like, he really, he won him some games. The Oak Park game, I'm going to remember that one with him. Um, you know, they do have Justin Greer Sykes. I think he's coming back next year. Um, very athletic, talented kid. Um, you know, kind of like, you know, I think they used him in a couple of times, you know what I mean? Critical situations. Um, but when you look at Avondale, you know, they like to win games run the ball, and they like to win games. They, they will throw it when they need to. So, I'm very curious to see how next year goes, especially in a second year of a new coach. I mean, like, it's going to be interesting to see how, um, how the, um, the coaching, I mean, like, I mean, how the transition, because usually under a new coach, usually year two is the one that, you know, you turn to turn everything around. But I think you, when we look at Avondale situation, you know, they're kind of like, they turned everything around in about a span of about, you know, about, about, about um, three months. And I think, you know, that's a, Credit to the players. Credit to the coaching staff for going in there. Um, a lot to love when you look at Avondale going forward. Um, I am very curious to see what division Avondale goes next year. If they if they stay in the, if we go, if the OA goes three divisions, if they go four divisions, I'm very curious to see how Avondale fits. I really think for Avondale, if they want to take a chance at the blue next year or or, you know, what I, mean? I think they should. And, you know, I, I, I would love to see how this Avondale team would match up against a team, against schools like Troy, Troy Athens. Um, you know, those are two rivals that I would love to see what Avondale go with um, and take on. I think it'll be a heck of a game. I know they play for a trophy, uh, the jug over between with Avondale and Troy. I think that's a great, that's a great trophy to have. Um Especially, you know, when you look at Avondale, I really like the direction that Coach Bob Meyer has that team going. Um, when you look at the Yellow Jackets, I'm um, going forward, heading into next year. So, a lot to really look at with Avondale. Um, you know, a lot to like. You knew they took the first step by winning a playoff game and knocking off Holly. Um, but then, you know, they ran into a very good Wild Lake Western program. A lot of experience on that team. Um, a lot of proven talent. They had the most points in the um, in Division Three. Um, now they get to move on and play Mason. Um, that's a rematch, um, and that's a very interesting because Mason went into Wall Lake and just destroyed Wall Lake Western um, pretty convincingly. Um, they got a good running back, a quarterback. I mean, but give credit where credits due. I mean, Wall Lake Western. Um, you know, they they attacked early, they dominated early. I mean, Avenel had to fight from behind all night. And it was a um, complete, um, it was a masterpiece for Wald Lake Western. Um, didn't turn the ball over. Um, forced Avondale, you know what I mean? Like, they used their, their playmakers offensively, and that was the game. So, give credit where credit's due in that one. So, for Avondale, great year for them. Um, great year for Coach Ron Meyer and his team. So... We'll see what happens there. I mean, like, we'll see what happens going forward, but I really like the direction that Avondale's been going. So, a lot to look at with them. Um, let's go to Division Two now. Um, Waterford Mott, 34, Seaholm, 21. Um, I talked to Coach Jim Dewald last week on the podcast, and he told me about a lot about Caleb Osborne, what he saw. And it looked like in that game he did not disappoint. Two passing touchdowns. Both over 60 yards. Um, and then he had a couple rushing touchdowns as well. Um, I've known Caleb Osborne when he, ever since he was in youth football. And, um, you know, he, he, he's a purified athlete. He is a purified athlete for Coach Chris Barr. And he led Waterford Mott. And there's a reason why he's a Toledo commit. And, you know, he actually ended up, um, he had a big game. He led. Water for Mott to that win. Um, 
Now, albeit Seaholm did fight, manage to fight back in that one, um, but it wasn't meant to be. Um, you know, I mean, like, so I give credit where credit's due to Chris Farr's defense for finding a way to shut down the veer. Um, you know, making them have to making them have to play from behind, which you look at in a veer offense. You know, if you if you run the veer and you're trailing in a game, that's not a good offense to um to go with, considering you're going to have to throw the ball. Um, but when I look at Seaholm this year, obviously for them, the success of beating Groves twice, um, winning the Blue Division this year, um, obviously you're going to lose the Kinney brothers. Um, Colton and Graydon Kinney. Um, I know frequently on Twitter or X, they always like my tweets. You know, when I recap things about, you know, in the games and all that, I mean, they always favor it and like them. So I appreciate that with, with the Seahome community and especially the Kinney brothers. I'll tell you what, I mean, like if I really hope colleges are looking at both Kinney brothers because for sure these two young men can play. I mean, Kyle Robbins, he can also play. I mean, Sean Emerson, he can also play. I mean, I'm telling you, Seaholm, I know a lot of people in Birmingham, they talk about Groves. Um, they talk about, you know, all the athletes they got. But there's some athletes in Seaholm as well. I mean, you know, you look at, of course, you know, the offenses, yeah, they're different. I mean, Groves likes to spread you out. Seaholm loves to run the veer. And Seaholm has got athletes. They got proven players. I mean, they have a proven winning coach in Jim Dewa. I mean, you look at the situation there and give credit to where credit's due. Um, you know, Seaholm, they had a great year. I mean, a lot of people didn't talk much about Seaholm. I mean, people really said, okay, the city of Birmingham, this is Groves' town. But when you look at the last, I know in football and boys basketball especially, um, the last, um, the last three, um, the last three meetings, if you count those sports, Seahome's won them all. I mean, Seahome upset Groves in the, um, first round of the districts over in, um, at Bloomby Hills last year. Um, I mean, albeit, yeah, Seahome had a lot of, um, was going through a lot, but once 2023 turned, Seahome basketball really did some damage and won the, um, blue title. Um, and then they knocked off Groves, um, which that was a big shock to the system, you know. With, but people say in Birmingham was, you know, Seaholm, you know, they kind of expected to win that game. Now, obviously, yeah, Groves is, they played an upper division, a tougher division. You know, it's kind of that very similar thing in football this year where Seaholm was in the blue, Groves was in the white. And, you know, Groves has played a tougher schedule. But Seaholm... They know Groves very well. I mean, these, the this community. I mean, like, you know, they play against each other. You know what I mean? They they played with each other. I mean, like in youth levels, in the middle school levels. I mean, like, you know, when they get into high school, it's kind of that open enrollment scenario where you know you see kids from Birmingham. They go to Birmingham. Some will go to Birmingham Brother Rice. I know that's an all Catholic school there, um, Catholic league school there. Um, some will go to Groves. Some will go to See Home. I mean, sometimes you know and. And I know we, I talked in detail with Coach Indy World about a couple months ago. Um, I know he was very upset about how that system worked over there in Birmingham. But, you know, but you look at the kids Seaholm has this year. They are grinders, hard workers. They know how to battle. And, you know, for them, you know, you know I, I kind of wish that the system would have given them a better opportunity. Um, Maybe to have a deep playoff run, um, maybe maybe have another maybe have another game under their belt, but unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. And you got to give credit where credit's due, though. You know, obviously, if we're talking Coach Evald. He said Osborne was the best quarterback I've seen all year, and you know, and it was proven. You know, Waterford might end up winning that game, thirty-four twenty-one. So. But for Seaholm next year, they do lose a lot of talent. Um, I will be very curious to see how this team responds, especially the skill positions. Um, and when you look at Seaholm, um, it just it kind you know, you know, a senior heavy team, 
you're going to have to replace a lot of talent. You're going to, it's almost like they're going to have to start over next year. And, you know, I mean, I know coach Jim D wall, he will get this team motivated. He'll get them ready to go. Um, you know, this program in the off season, um, I'll be very curious to see which players step up on C home because at the end of the day here, they're going to have to step up and, you know, and I think honestly here, um, I think I got a chance to do some wonders, even though they lose all that talent. But I'll tell you what, colleges need to go to Birmingham and look at some of these home kids. I mean, they are proven players. They are proven. They've had a lot of experience. They've been through the wars. And I'll tell you what, I mean, like if, I mean, I'll tell you what, and I think home, you know, in the future, they're going to be a good place. They're in a good spot right now. So we'll see what happens going forward there as we head into, um, the um off season so that's going to be something to really really watch for as we go forward there um the, the division one um we're gonna go to the saturday game first southfield arts and tech knocking off detroit cast tech um 36 25 was the final there i was really surprised honestly at the score because i really thought this game be a lot closer but i guess the tandem of isaiah marshall and juan jarrett had a big game. Jared, of course, I think he had two touchdowns. Um, Marshall had a great game for Southfield. Arson Tech, it was a complete role reversal of what happened last year. And you look at that game last year, you know, early on in the season, in the playoff game last year, it was um, Isaiah Marshall had a really rough time with Detroit Cast Tech. He had a really tough time with that defense in Detroit Cast Tech. We knew they were coming off an emotional high after beating West Bloomfield that prior week in the first round. And then they just went and beat Southfield Arts and Tech. So the Warriors said, you know what? I mean, we're not going to have this performance again. I mean, like, I know we beat you at Wayne State earlier in the year. But, you know, we're not going to, we're going to, we're a senior heavy team. We've been to the wars. And... You know, to overcome, to go where you want to get to, you got to get by Detroit Cast Tech. Um, and Southfield Arts and Tech did that against a very good PSL opponent in Detroit Cast Tech. And they found a way to shut down Sadler. They found a way to, um, they found a way behind the play of Isaiah Marshall. Um, they found a way to win that game. I mean, they really found a way to just say, you know what? We're not taking it anymore. I mean, like, we want to go places. We want to be the best Southfield Arts and Tech team that's ever had here. Um, they got an opportunity to do that if they can knock off Chippewa Valley um, over at Chippewa Valley. Of course, Chippewa Valley is coming off a 17-7 win against Macomb, Dakota, um, where they, um, of course, they beat Macomb, Dakota twice in one year. Um, and they've had Dakota's number lately, so... You know, credit where credit to this should be a really interesting game between the Big Reds and the Warriors. I mean, it'll be really inter interesting. They're going to preview that game in a little bit. But when you look at Southfield, I thought defensively they played well early and they held on just enough. So credit to Coach Aaron Marshall's team. Um, really just, they really were the ones that, you know, they found a way in that one. They overcame Detroit Cast Tech. Um, overcame their athletes, overcame a lot, and they just, and they knocked off an opponent. I mean, like, and I'll tell you what much right now, Southfield Arts and Tech, they have been a completely different team since their loss to West Bloomfield in Week 8, where they were just completely humbled in that game. Um, so when you look at Southfield Arts and Tech, um, you got to like where they're at right now. So that's something to really look at with the Warriors. Um, especially having to go on the road um, into Macomb County um, next week and this week. And it'll be really interesting to see how that one goes. So between the um, big reds and the warriors. So really interesting to see how that one goes. And now we go to the um, games where some of, some of those games were questionably officiated. Uh, the first one we're going to go is West Bloomby, Utica Eisenhower. Um, there was some controversy in that game. Yes, West Bloomby won 24-6 at Swinehart against Utica Eisenhower, but when you only have a four-man crew, that's a problem. I mean, that is a serious problem because 
you know, and I look at the MHA when it comes to fishing. You look at, there's a reason why in the OA there's seven refs. There is seven officials that referee varsity games. You kind of want that to happen in the, um, you kind of want that to happen with, um, you know, with the um, playoffs. I think MHA seriously needs to consider that because when you have four or five crew, four or five um, officials officiating, sometimes you kind of let a lot of things get away. And, you know, there's kind of like that scenario. There was, it was not good in that game against, uh, and it looked like it was bad on both sides of that game at Swinehart. But I think particularly there was one call that I would be really upset with um, and that they didn't give Coach Jack Hilbert a timeout um, before they were going to halftime. It was a 6-6 game. So I was really shocked that they didn't give him that timeout. Um, but I'll tell you what, I'll be honest with you. Jalen Alos played really well in that game. He picked up Preston Crumb twice. Um, now I'm not sure if, you know, one of those was a pick six for a touchdown, but when I had when I talked to um Civic Center TV's Tyler Keft, um great great guy, by the way. Um, would recommend his show, um, would recommend his show um to OA now um, viewers. Um, when you look at West Bloomfield, Jalen Alos gets played everywhere for Coach Zach Hilbert. He has played quarterback. He's played linebacker. He's been in the secondary. He can play wide receiver. I mean, he's virtually almost like a modified version of Taysom Hill of the New Orleans Saints. That is a good comparison to compare Jalen Alos to is Taysom Hill. And I think that is a perfect combination. Now, albeit, you know, I mean, he can play anywhere for that Lakers team. He can play anywhere. And he was very instrumental in the game against Utica Eisenhower. We had two picks, uh, Preston Crumb. Obviously, Preston Crumb, we know what he's more than capable of doing. Of course, um, obviously, the wind really was a component in that game as well. Um... So when you really look at Utica Eisenhower, um, you know, I was really, I was surprised that, you know, the wind kind of kept their offense in check. And it kind of did. Um, obviously, Rick, Rick Juan Nance had a big game. He had, um, I think, three touchdowns. Um, obviously, one to Brendan Davis Swain. Um, I mean, like that was a huge that was a huge touchdown. Um, but also two to Elijah Durham. It was gonna be in that game was gonna be was whose star players were gonna show up in that game. Whose star players were gonna absolutely show up in that game. And West Bloomfield star players showed up in the nick of time in the second half. And especially when you look at obviously the Raquan Nance to Elijah Durham combination. Um, that says a lot. You know, obviously with the with what he's been doing. I think Elijah Durham's got the single season record for touchdowns at West Bloomfield. I think he broke Trey Mosley's record. I'm not sure. I got to ask Tyler that question. Um, but, you know, but Jalen Alos was the one that really, and I'm not knocking West Bloomfield's offense or anything like that, but Jalen Alos is the reason why West Bloomfield's playing in the regional final right now. And I think, honestly, when you look at the Lakers, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, because it was a 6 6 game. It could have been much worse, um, but give credit where credit's due, though. West Bloomfield's offense woke up, and behind Nance's three touchdowns, behind Durham's two receiving touchdowns, and Brennan Davis Swain's um, other touchdowns, I kind of felt like I thought he had a pick six for a touchdown. I mean, I wrote that in a column um, that, I mean, like when I had my conversation with Tyler, um, that I know he had two interceptions, and he told me one went for a touchdown. But I guess they didn't call it, and um, that's how Swain got his touchdown. Um, but it is what it is. West bottom line is, if you're a Laker fan, if you're West Bloomfield, um, you move on the next round. And I know a lot of people thought West Bloomfield was going to play Lake Orion, but it's not going to be Lake Orion. It's Clarkston that they're going to be playing. I mean, we're going to talk that game in a minute because that game's got like controversy written all over it and really questionable calls but I thought you know what I mean like um but 
to West Bloomfield, they had their own fair share of terrible calls as well. I mean, like, they had a couple of terrible calls against them. Um, we always obviously talked about the timeout situation with Zach Hilbers' before it went to the half. Um, you know, there were a couple of calls against Eisenhower that you can see the Eisenhower that um, didn't go their way. Um, and this comes down to the debate question about should the MHA use seven officials for the playoffs? I mean, they're going to probably say no, but I'm going to, but these two games here, I'm going to tell you, you need seven officials for. And you need officials who know these teams really well. I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't think, you know, the officials, they know the teams, what their style of play is like that. And this is where the Lake Orion Clarkson game comes into play. So let's go to this game because I'm going to try to be really nice in this game because there were terrible calls on both sides. Um, obviously, Joey DeBrink getting thrown out. That was a terrible call. Um, the roughing the passer call against Caden DeGraffenbury. That was a terrible call. The, the pass interference place against Lake Orion. Terrible calls. Heck, even the one against Desmond Stevens, the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. That was a terrible call. I mean, like, they had... And to me, this is an officiating crew that doesn't know both teams. They don't. So, when you look at the game there, in that fourth quarter especially, where just so meant so much emotion on both sides, you know, you look at, of course, you know, you look at, obviously, you know, you look at the game, how it was played early on. I mean, it started, uh, the game started off, I mean, Billy, Lake Warren moved the ball, but Billy Roberson fumbled the ball. Clarkson picked the ball up. You know, Clarkson went down the field. Um, led, of course, by Brady Collins and Desmond Stevens. They had the, he had the first touchdown off the, um, off a quarter, off the, um, off the Wildcat. And it was 7 out in West Bloomfield. On uh, 7 out Clarkson early. Um, Lake Warren went down, scored, um, responded well, tied it up 7, um, got a fourth down stop, and then, and then they went down and scored again 14-7. So 14-7 the half. So, you know, and this is where it gets interesting. I mean, third quarter, you know, Clarkson goes down, gets a big play, um, big play to Dez, um, get a field goal out of that until 14-10. And then Clarkson's defense did a pretty good job holding Lake Orion to only three points, so 17-10. Fourth quarter gets really interesting. Um, Clarkson goes down, scores, ties up 17 um, and then Lake Orion, of course, with Billy Roberson, um, getting a touchdown, making it 24 17. Then a pick six from Andrew Parker. So now Lake Orion's up 31 17. And then Clarkson goes down and scores, um, a touchdown. Um, I think it was Brady Collins' um, I think it was the, um, it was the, um, the zone read quarterback keeper. Um, then I give credit coach Justin Pintar here for calling this. Going for two makes it 30, 30, um, 31 25. You know, so I'm saying to myself, okay, Clarkson's going. I mean, why did Clarkson go for two? Because if they don't get it, you're down eight, you know, and you got it. And when they made it within 30, 31 25. So then Lake Orion goes and kicks and gets the kickoff return for a touchdown with Billy Roberson. Missed a two point conversion, so it's thirty nine. So it's now thirty seven to twenty five, and then Lake Orion just gives up a terrible, terrible. I mean, like a breakdown in coverage leads to Brody Cozen scoring eighty yards, um, and then so it's thirty seven thirty two. So here's where it gets interesting. Clarkson goes for an onside kick. So I kind of look at the replay and I'm saying, myself, okay. Um, you know, so, so it's kind of hard seeing where I was sitting at from the, um, where I was sitting at. And I kind of figured, I thought in my head that they had 12. I mean, they, I thought that in my head they had 12 because, but then I give Clarkson basketball's Twitter page here, some credit here for showing me the still of that, um, that they had 11, there was 11 shadows on there, but 
when I look at that far north corner, I mean, like, I, I swear I saw, like, another, like, another head there. I just saw, like, another head there. So, but, anyway, um, Clarkson recovered the onside kick. Um, had it, I mean, like, had the ball. And then this is where, um, you know, things get really get crazy. Um, Lake Orion, it was 4th and 22. Um, Brady Collins throws the ball. Um, gets caught by um, Brody Cozen. Um, I think that was through two defenders. And then Griffin Bowman moved the ball, ran the ball, and then it led to a touchdown for Clarkson. Clarkson takes the um, 38-37 lead, um, missed the two-point conversion. Lake Orion has a chance with 47 seconds left. Um, they get a first down deep in Clarkson territory. And then, um, then Tierra Hill throws a pick to, um, Griffin Bowman. Seals the game, game over. Clarkson wins that one 38-37. So, credit where credit's due with Clarkson. Um, that team was virtually depleted. A lot with the, all the injuries they had. Um, I thought, you know what I mean, Lake Orion had opportunities to win that game. Um, when you can't get off the field on fourth and long, you're not going to win. That's always been, if you have a good defense, I mean, like you look at, of course, Lake Orion's defense has been really good all year long. But you can't get off, if you can't get off the field on third and fourth down, you're going to, you're giving them opportunity, you're giving opponents opportunities to score. And Clarkson did that. They took advantage of the opportunities they were given. I mean, Des Stevens played well. Brady Cozen played well. Brady Collins played well. Um, it kind of had flashbacks for me of the eleven of the 2011 game in the first round when Lake Orion lost to Wild Lake um, Central when when Clarkson played a really good time possession when Wild Lake Central played a really good time possession game. Um, 2006. I remember that game really well. I mean, it kind of had like a combination of that, where I remember when Eric, remember when Clark's did um scored a touchdown when, you know, Lake Orion can get a stop, that sealed that game. Lake Orion was coming undefeated that game, and and that was a district final, and then the 2012 game, just the third and thirty um the third and long that Clarkson had. In that game, it kind of felt like in the three, four downs that Clarkson had, they they hit everything. They hit everything. And, you know, you got to get credit where credit's due. They made plays. They made plays. You know? You know, if you're a Dragon fan, you're going to be sick to your stomach seeing this. Because when you look at the game here, Lake Orion's offense, you know, they had... I thought Lake Orion offensively played well in that game. They played well. I mean, Bill Robertson had three touchdowns. Um, you know, T.R. Hill was oh, was solid. The turnovers didn't help. But Clarkson had turnovers himself. But I really think officiating was questionable at best. Very questionable. Particularly against Lake Orion. Because I thought three calls they had were just absolutely atrocious. You know, and it and it and it, and it extended Clarkson strides, really did. So when you look at that game, um, when you look at Clarkson now, and people are gonna say, you know, they didn't have a chance coming in this game, and yet they go into Lake Orion who's undefeated and win that game. I mean. I, I mean, like, there's it was a combination of things that went wrong in that game for Lake Orion and a combination of things that went right for Clarkston. They needed a big game from Des Stevens. They got it. They needed a big game from Brody Cozen. They got it. But the one that really is going to get me upset, the defense, Lake Orion's defense collapsing in the fourth quarter, the Debrinka ejection did not help things. I thought that was a terrible call. The Caden DeGraff and rough in the passer penalty. That was a terrible call. Um, the pass interference penalties against Lake Orion, that didn't help at all. Um, but, you know, credit where credit's due. But this is where I'm going to get really upset with Clarkston. The celebration after the game. 
was when they still ran the yellow, and I and I applaud the coaches for you know getting them back, you know just talking to them. It kind of felt similar to the 2021 game when um, Clarkson celebrated on the yellow, um, you know, and I think obviously, and I know I know a lot of people at Clarkson was upset when um when Lake Orion beat Clarkson in the regular season. Lake Orion celebrated a little bit on the sea at Clarkston. So it's, it's, I'm not being mean here, but I'm just saying, you know what I mean? When you come off a win like that, you know what I mean? When you come, when you come off a win like that, you know, you got it, you win with class and you lose with class. And that's, you know, that's what I, I took from that game Friday night at Lake Orion was, you know, when you, when you, and I know it's an emotional game. Football is an emotional game. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, you could have, you could have celebrated that a little bit better. You know what I mean? Instead of having to celebrate on the 50 yard line, you could celebrate at the 25. You know what I mean? Like that. You know what I mean? And that would have been perfectly fine to me. But, you know, I'll be honest with you. Credit where credit's due to Coach Justin Pintar and his team. Um, for Lake Orion, they do lose a lot next year, but they do return. They got T.R. Hill coming back. You do have Jackie Vasquez coming back. Trey Pacmara. Um, they got a couple of players on that offensive line coming back. I mean, Brendan Eliasson. Um, Landon Morris is another one coming back. Um, so Lake Orion, I think is going to be back. I think they're going to be fine. I mean, they're going to be a little bit weaker next year. You, know, you do lose Kane to Griffin Reed. You do lose Joey to Brinkat. You do lose Dominic Novak. That's going to be tough losses if you coach Chris Bell to replace. Um, but bottom line is, you know, when you're in that situation, you know what I mean? You kind of, a lot of things that snowballed for Lake Orion. Um, the fact that they let the refs get in your head. You kind of gave Clarkson life to believe and all that. Um, it is what is. So, so Clarkson moves on, plays West Bloomfield, um, which that'll be a really interesting game. Um, for Lake Orion, it is um, what if, you know what I mean? I wrote that in the thoughts. What if, you know what I mean? Lake Orion, you know what I mean? You know, what if, you know, that's what it is. And I know there were a lot of other teams that lost around the state this weekend that were, um, you know, I know Whitehall was upset by Big Rapids. Um Obviously lost by one in that game um, off a block kick. Um, we know Celine was destroyed by Belleville. Um, you know, and that was a shock. Um, so, and I know it's a lot of people look at saying like, well, Clarkson upset Lake Orion. You know what I mean? You know, you look at the records. True. But you got to look at it from a different perspective. You know what I mean? Like, you know. I mean, like, from that game. So, it is what is. So, we'll see what happens going forward there in that one. Um, let's go to the, um, let's do my projections this week here on the um, matchups. Um, obviously, you got Harper Woods and Carlton Airport. That's a Saturday afternoon game. Um, we know how good Carlton Airport is. They'll score in bunches. Um, they beat Dearborn Devon Child. Very impressive in that game. It was a tight game. Um, I think in that game, when you look at Carlton Airport, the way that, that team's been, yes, they got a better record than Harper Woods. They got a better, um, you know what I mean? They are offensively, the stats say that they've been a better team. But yet, they're the ones going on the road in the Wayne County to take on a very good Pioneers team. So when you look at that game and you preview that game, um, I think when you look at Harper Woods, the way that that team's been playing, and you look at Division Four now being wide open, especially where Harper Woods is at, especially in wake of what happened to Chelsea against Hazlitt, the team that I thought would give when I look at the other teams around there, like Goodrich, I don't see Goodrich giving Harper Woods a lot of problems. I'd be shocked if they do. Um, but Chelsea would have been a team that I would have been worried about if I was Coach Robbo. I mean, like, 
But now has when Hazlitt beaten Chelsea, that was a big deal. That's a huge deal for Harper Woods because I think they're pat the Ford Field. You know, it might be a little easier, might not. But, you know, that's a big obstacle away from Harper Woods. Because if they play Goodrich right now, I would still take Harper Woods over Goodrich. Doesn't matter what the record says. Harper Woods has played a by far tougher schedule than, than, um, than Carlton Airport. And they've also played a tougher schedule than Goodrich. I mean, you really look at Harper Woods the way that team is. You have two quarterbacks who have been playing outstanding football. You can move one of your quarterbacks and play wide receiver, and they can still be very effective. You have a running back and Kobe Taylor who has been playing really good football. Your offensive line's been playing really good. Your defense is probably, one, I think, one of the best defenses in Division Four. I don't know if Carlton Airport has seen a team like this. And the fact that they have to go up to Wayne County to play the Pioneers. You look at, of course, the game. I thought Harper Woods' is toughest test in the postseason thus far, honestly, was against Croswell Lex. And we know how good that team is. Croswell Lexington is a very good program. They're well coached. So when I look at this game here on paper, I mean, like people say, look on paper, they should give the victory to the airport. I'm not agreeing with that. I think when you look at the Pioneers, the way that team's been playing, you look at the wins that they've had this year, you look at, of course, the team, and also the teams they played. Harper Woods has played Lake Orion, Stony Creek, Clarkson, Southfield, Groves, Rochester, I mean, Roseville. I mean, those are not easy games. Those are not easy games. And the bottom line is, they found a way to win most of those games. <laughs> and the games they lost to, they were all the legit competition. Mostly teams in Division One. Rose was in D2. But they played a lot of D1s and D2s. That's going to get you ready for the postseason. That'll get you ready. This game will not be close. I like Harper Woods in this one against Carlton Airport. And it wouldn't surprise me if Harper Woods blows him out. It really wouldn't surprise me. Because of the schedule Harper Woods has played. If Harper Woods has, if Harper Woods struggles in this game, that could be trouble. But bottom line is, I don't see the Pioneers struggling. If Harper Woods was in D2 like they were in last year, this is a game they could struggle. They're not. They're in D4. And I think the Pioneers are going to go in there with the, with the found of confidence. And I think they're going to roll in this game. And I think they're going to get ready for the state semifinals. Most likely going to probably be seeing Goodrich. But we'll see. But we'll see. That's why they play the game. Now, I don't know why it's a Saturday afternoon. Maybe the 90 miles thing. I don't know. But in this game here, I'm going to take the um, the Pioneers over, over Carlton Airport. So we'll see what happens in that one. D3, we don't have um, D3 Avondale being out. Um, D2, C Holmes out. Um, so now let's go to D1. There's two matchups here that affect OA teams here. Um, next, we have... Um, Southfield Arson Tech and Chippewa Valley. Chippewa Valley this year shared the Mac Red title with Utica Eisenhower. Um, this is a big measuring stick game for Southfield because this is where the past team, I think in 2016 or 2017, went to the regional final. Uh, I think it was either 2017 or 20. I got to go back to my memory bank, but. But, the, but if Southfield Arts and Tech can win this game, this would be the longest that the Warriors have been in in the postseason. So when you really look at this game here, Chippewa Valley, we know they got a very good quarterback. Um, I got to figure out what Schuster it is. Is it Tommy Schuster? 
Um, I got to figure out what Schuster it is. Um, you know, I mean, like, you know, we don't cover the Mac a lot. The OA, you know, I mean, the OA. I know, I know the Mac had used to have a podcast. I think it was Zach and Zach podcast. Um, I don't know what ever happened to him, but coming in that game is when you look at South, when you look at Chippewa Valley, well coached under Coach Scott Merchant. They have always been well prepared. And when you look at Southfield, the Warriors are coming off an emotional high. They knocked off Detroit Cast Tech. They previously knocked off Dearborn Fortson. So basically, Southfield, you know, they're coming into Chippewa Valley, you know, with a lot of confidence. Chippewa Valley, same thing. They knocked off Macomb, Dakota. I mean, you know, anytime you beat Macomb, Dakota twice, that says something. Really does. So, in this game here, this could be a tight game. This I expect this is going to be a tight game. Because when you look at Southfield, they have improved running the ball. Their line's been solid all year long. And Isaiah Marshall's finding proven wide receivers. Juwan Jarrett, he had a big game. They still got, they still got Tashi Bracefield. I mean, Bracefield, yeah, he didn't have much. He didn't. He didn't have a like a good game stat line wise, but he had a good game. And you look at it, but also you know they they were. I mean, Bracefield is Marshall's top target. That's why Juwan Jarrett had a big game. So, but Marshall's got proven talent, proven weapons, and he's using them. And their defense has been solid. It's been okay. I mean, you look at, of course, defense has been allowing over 20, I mean, like, almost, like, near, like, over, like, well, between 14 to 20 points. I mean, you had allowed 25 against Troy Cass Tech. But Troy Cass Tech, let's not forget, they got a good offense. I mean, Corey Sadler's a good quarterback. Yeah, he's young, but he's a good quarterback. I mean, but the Warriors' defense did just enough in that game. They did just enough, and they won that game. In this game here against Chippewa Valley, is can Southfield Arts and Tech find that balance? Can they find that balance against a Big Reds team that you know that it's going to be an interesting match of how they're going to handle the Rowdy Red Zone? I'll be very curious to see how Southfield handles that student section with Chippewa Valley. The coaching matchup's interesting between Aaron Marshall and, um, and um, Scott Merchant. It is really interesting there. Schuster and Marshall's the quarterback matchup. What I think the key is going to be is whose offense shows up in this game. Whose offense balances itself out and not be one-dimensional. Because if, if one of these teams is one-dimensional, that could spell trouble. And you look at that game. Um, I think Southfield Arts and Tech, the way that that team's been playing, I don't know how the Mac Red is, especially when you look at the indicator. With I think the indicator for me is West Bloomfield's win against Utica Eisenhower. Um, also, West Bloomfield did beat Chippewa Valley. Um, so when I look at this game here on paper, um, I think you gotta go Southfield. I mean, I, I mean, people are gonna say Chippewa Valley, and if they say Chippewa Valley, that's fine. But I'm going to go a and in this one. Because I think a and is, I think, if a and wins this game, this is going to be probably one of the best teams in school history with a and And obviously, you know, they want to see a red opponent. They want to see, I mean, they've played, South, they played West Bluebill and Clarkson both times this year. They played them. I mean, Southfield love another crack at West Bluefield. I mean, and they got a win against Clarkston. So, when you look at that matchup, but also Chippewa Valley, they might want another crack at West Bluefield, considering what happened to them last year. Because they were having them week one at Wayne State. When they lost that one on a two-point conversion by Brendan Davis Swain. And then all the storms came. And I remember that night. When we had all those tornadoes that went into William, that went into William, we had those tornado warnings. And that and that windstorm. 
That was rough. Really rough. Um, but in this game here, I got Southfield Arts and Tech. Um, I think they're going to go in the Chippewa Valley, go in and um, silence the Rowdy Red Zone, and I think they're going to go in there and win that game. I think Isaiah Marshall has a big game. Um, I think Zeke Marshall, he's going to show why the um, why um, A&T's offense is one of the most lethal in the entire state. So we'll see what happens in that game. And then we have West Bluefield and Clarkston. Um, this is a rematch of a 44-36 Clarkston win at Clarkston. Um, I think I was in week six. Um, and then that game was really, I mean, I was, I think the both Bowman twins is um, going out party. I think Griffin Bowman had two touchdowns in that game. Um, Dez Stevens was Dez Stevens. Um, Brody Cozen had a big game. Now, albeit West Bloom was out five guys. So don't get me wrong there. West Bloomfield's got a couple guys back. I think Bryce Rowe's back. Um, this is an interesting match because it's in the swamp. Clarkson went into Lake Orion and won that game 38-37. Um, West Bloomfield won on the road at Swinehart 24-6. Um, this one could be very interesting because Clarkson's banged up right now. They got a boatload of injuries right now. And they played emotionally their best game against Lake Orion. They put everything into that game. They put everything into that game. And they found a way to win that game. They found a way. West Bloomfield is motivated for this game. Because they lost to Clarkson earlier in the year. They lost to him. And I know that Coach Jack Hilbers will have that team ready. They will have them ready. I know Rick Quan Nance wants another shot at him. I know Elijah Durham wants another shot at him. Jalen Alos wants another shot. I mean, Brandon Davis Swain. I, mean, I can't believe we even talked a lot about him all day on this podcast. I haven't talked a lot about Brandon Davis Swain. And yet he's a Colorado commit. So when I look at West Bloomfield against Clarkston, this one looks to me, this is this should be a close game, but I don't know if it will be. Because Clarkson's injuries, they're huge right now. And I think West Bloomfield is healthy right now. They're getting healthier by the by they're getting healthier. Um we don't know, um, but obviously when you look at this matchup here, it's in the swamp. Um, home field matters in this game. Now, I'll be a Clarkson. It's going to say, well, we've been, we've gone to West Bloomfield. We've won there. I mean, like, we're not afraid to go anywhere. We just went in Lake Orion and just won there. Um, so Clarkson's going to come in with a never say die attitude. Um, they're going to have to basically put the same game plan they had against Lake Orion and then some against West Bloomfield. Now, can that happen? Sure. Could Clarkson go in and beat West Bloomfield? Absolutely. They could do it. But they're going to need a heck of a game. Exactly almost similar like they did against Lake Orion without the mistakes, without the turnovers. They do that. They are more than capable. Do I see it? I do not. For several reasons. West Bloomfield's motivation. West Bloomfield's. West Bloomfield's obviously, you know, I think their defense is going to short some things up. I mean, normally, sophomore quarterbacks struggle on the road. Um, Wasn't the case last week. Um, with Brady Collins, but I just think West Bloomfield goes in there. Um, I think David Swain has a big game. I think Elijah Durham has a big game. I think it can expose Clarkson secondary in this game. Um, the only question is the weather conditions. If it's a clear night, favors West Bloomfield. If, it grind, if it's a rainy, messy, cold night, favors Clarkson. So, but in this game, I'm going to take the Lakers in this one. To knock off the Wolves. I just think that West Bloomfield. The way that they're playing. 
Um, I think they're on a mission, and I think they're going to be the ones that move on here um, in this game. I think they're going to beat Clarkston um, maybe by two scores, maybe by a touchdown, but I got West Bloom in this game. Um, knocking off a um, knocking off a very gusty Clarkson team. Um, I don't know if they're running. I mean, like, so we'll see what happens. I mean, they're gonna be they're running on. Um, I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think the injuries could be an issue in this game here, and I think Clarkson's got a lot of them right now. West will be starting to get a lot of them back, so we'll see what happens going forward there. All right, everybody, I'm gonna sign off here. Make sure you follow the blog at Saginaw Bay 4650 at blogspot.com. Keep an eye on the volleyball regionals over at um. Macomb, Dakota, and um, Grand Blank um, for volleyball. Also, the football regionals coming up as well. Um, we'll see what happens going forward there. All right, I'm signing off here. Um, take care. God bless. Make sure you follow the blog at Second Bay 4650 at blogspot.com. Boss keeping on the basketball situation. We're at Farmington and Stony Creek. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, all right, I'm signing off here. Take care. God bless. And I'll see you all next week. Take care and see you then. God bless all.